Jens Nielsen is a professor of systems and synthetic biology at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. And Professor Jean-Marie Tarascon from the Collège de France, he holds the chair in chemistry of solids energy. So uh, professors, uh, if you are here, uh, there, there's, I recognize Professor Nielsen and Professor Tarascon. That's it, nice big round of applause for our, our two winners. Uh, I had hoped to have one of those really big checks that you see on television to, to give them, but I know they received their awards last night. I'm sure everything's very uh, safely tucked up underneath the mattresses in, in your hotel. Uh, all I have to actually offer the professors now is, is the stage. Uh, if you'd like to uh, perhaps uh, tell us a little bit more about the work that, uh, that led you to this uh, prestigious, prestigious award. Uh, Professor Nielsen is going to begin. Professor Tarascon, if perhaps you want to uh, take a seat. Uh, Professor Nielsen's uh, lecture will be on engineering yeast for production of advanced biofuels. Professor Nielsen. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, of course, uh, let me also start to say that I'm, of course, deeply honored uh, to receive this, uh, this award. Uh, this uh, has been fantastic also to be at, at this meeting here and hear about all the developments uh, in the area of uh, transportation sector. Uh, so, but what I'm going to, to talk a little bit about is uh, the research that we're doing on developing advanced biofuels uh, using yeast as a, as a microbial cell factory. So uh, we, uh, let me just see here how I can slip for, go forward. Um, uh, so, uh, we heard a lot about uh, establishing a sustainable uh, transportation sector for the future. Uh, we heard a lot about electric cars, uh, but we also heard that uh, even by 2040, the, the optimistic uh, predictions is that only about a third of the uh, personal cars will be electric. And so, uh, it is absolutely necessary if we're going to establish a sustainable society that we do find alternative uh, solutions to uh, the internal combustion engines that will still be on the road at that time, uh, if we are going to uh, become independent of oil. And we heard uh, there are many reasons for, for why we have to become independent of oil. Of course, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, uh, cleaner technology. Uh, but also, we heard a very strong argument yesterday that oil is a, a very strong supporter of terrorism in the world. And we have to move forward uh, in, in doing something about that in the society uh, quite rapidly. So uh, that's uh, the field that we are working in, uh, in developing this so-called biorefinery concepts. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, where uh, we are developing cell factories that can be used to convert uh, biomass. Uh, that biomass can come from various types of feedstocks. It can be from wood, it can be leftovers from, uh, from the agricultural sector. Uh, this biomass can be degraded and pretreated into sugars, and these sugars are then converted into the fuels or chemicals uh, that can then replace uh, what we are currently deriving from, from oil. And the uh, conversion is done uh, by a biocatalyst, very similar to uh, traditional uh, chemical industry that use catalysts for, for conversion processes. But in this case, we are relying on living cells, uh, and, and we are particularly focusing on using baker's yeast for this process. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, baker's yeast is already well adapted in the ethanol industry, and so it is a, a well-implemented uh, biocatalyst in the, in the large-scale industry for uh, biofuel production. So, but there are a number of challenges uh, associated with this uh, because if we look at the, the typical value chain uh, when we are going to convert uh, the, the biomass feedstock into the chemicals from fuels uh, of the future, uh, uh, we are talking about several steps, of course, as in any other processing chain. Uh, the pretreatment and the downstream aspects, purification and formulation, are quite well developed. And so what is really the uh, research intensive part is developing the biocatalyst by itself. Uh, there are various uh, ex examples already on the market uh, where the development of just the, the biocatalyst have been costing in the order of $50 million. And this is one of the major barriers today that simply the investment for the R&D is too high. Uh, that's also why we see that some of the case studies that, uh, and some of the examples that have been products that have been dropped to the mar market, like isobutanol, farnesine, and 1,4-butendiol, this has been done uh, through partnership, often with large chemical companies and uh, smaller uh, biotech companies. So, uh, 
our objective is to bring down those costs uh, of the development of the cell factory. Uh, so, so we need to bring that down, uh, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of time. And that's where we are working on novel technologies. So today, uh, what is uh, happening is that you are often having a first uh, proof of principle kind of strain or catalyst that, that can make a very few amount, a little amount of the chemical that you're interested to use maybe as a drop-in biofuel. Uh, and you need to improve that further uh, until you get to the final uh, biocatalyst or the final strain that can meet the uh, financial criteria for having a commercially viable process. But we, uh, through new technologies, we aim to, uh, to bring down that uh, time and cost uh, significantly. And what we're doing uh, in that is, is, is applying a very traditionally engineering approach, uh, like is done in any other engineering discipline. Uh, we are developing advanced computer models to actually design. And this is, of course, more challenging because we are talking about living cells where we don't know all what all the components of these systems are doing. Uh, we are still learning in that process, but still we are integrating that information in mathematical models for design. We can then build using genetic engineering, and there's been a lot of advancement of doing that faster and more efficient recently. We then test uh, these uh, different uh, constructs, and we uh, acquire new knowledge about that. And going through this uh, cycle in a fast and efficient way, we've seen uh, quite significant development in recent years. And as I said, uh, in the uh, biotech industry, many different uh, microbial cell factories are used, but we are particularly focusing on yeast. Uh, the reasons for this is that it's extremely well characterized, it's already used for bioethanol production, but also many other processes and products as is listed here. Uh, and there are a lot of developments going on, and one of the reasons for this is, of course, the long-term use of yeast, but also that it is one of the organisms that we know the most of. Uh, and the reason why we know so much about yeast is that it actually has many similarities with the cells that are, com that are making up the human body. And uh, so therefore, there's been a lot of uh, fundamental studies on yeast and its metabolism, and we can recruit and, uh, and take that knowledge and use that also for engineering. So what we're doing is that we are engineering uh, the metabolism of yeast to make a, a whole range of different chemicals uh, listed here. Uh, some of these uh, can be used as, as drop-in biofuels, uh, alkanes, fatty alcohols, uh, some of them can be used for commodity chemicals, and they go all the way down also to real specialty chemicals that can be used in pharmaceuticals. And in this uh, process, we are developing new technologies referred to as synthetic and systems biology, where we are acquiring new knowledge about uh, the yeast cell factory. And so uh, let me give you a couple of examples of what uh, we have done in recent years related particularly to biofuels. Uh, so one uh, uh, particular interest has been to develop uh, long-chain hydrocarbons that can be used as drop-in, for example, for jet fuels, but also for uh, heavy diesel trucks or ships. Uh, and these are derived and have been derived for millions of years ago when oil was originally developing from uh, fatty acids that were uh, uh, hydrogenated into the hydrocarbons that we know of today. And so uh, all microbial cells or all cells, in fact, have the capability of making these long chain hydrocarbons, but they're sitting in oxygen, oxygen groups at the end in the form of an acid. And uh, what we need to do at the final step is uh, to take that uh, fatty acid and convert it into the final alkanes and alkenes here. However, uh, there's also been a lot of development of actually doing a, a chemical hydrogenation of fatty, al fatty acids. And so, for example, Prem in Sweden has developed a, a, a quite efficient uh, hydrogenation process where they take leftover oils from the, from the forest industry and hydrogenate that and use that now as blending in diesel uh, that you buy in Sweden. So, uh, but we have been uh, engineering yeast metabolism and significantly improved its uh, abilities to now produce uh, these fatty acids so we can begin to take uh, biomass and convert that efficiently into these uh, fatty acids that can then either be chemically converted or directly by yeast uh, into these product of interest. Now, uh, however, yeast is producing uh, carbon chains of uh, 16 or 18 carbon atoms, and so that doesn't necessarily fit exactly the requirement that you will have in the fuel industry. So we were also interested to look in if we could produce actually carbons, uh, hydrocarbons of varying chain length. 
uh, and particularly in the shorter range, there's a lot of interest, of course, in, in producing C8 or C12 for either gasoline or jet fuels. And in order to overcome this, uh, we looked into the, uh, the biocatalyst inside the yeast cells that are actually making these uh, fatty acids. And this is a multifunctional biocatalyst. Uh, it's called a fatty acid synthase that uh, uh, basically runs in an iterative fashion. And each, in each round, it adds two carbon atoms to the uh, growing carbon chain. And so what we did was we inserted a new activity into that biocatalyst. So when it gets to eight or 10 carbons, it's cleaved off. Uh, and then it can be, uh, be secreted by the yeast, and hereby we can now produce shorter chain hydrocarbons that can then be used, for example, in jet or uh, in, in, in uh, gasoline. Uh, this is something that we work closely with uh, the, the French energy company Total, but we've also established a spin-out company that is exploiting these technologies uh, for various applications. So a question that, uh, of course, we're often asked uh, about uh, the, the prospect of using biofuels uh, is whether this is financially viable and actually is cost competitive. And uh, it is not cost competitive if we directly compare with oil. We did some uh, overall engineering calculations of the total cost, and we have to have a sugar price of down to uh, 10 cents, US cents per kilogram. And the current sugar price is maybe around 40, 30, swinging between 30 and 40, depending on what part of the country you're getting your sugar uh, from. Uh, so you can clearly see we cannot compete. Uh, if you have subsidy uh, in the process, you get closer to, to what sugar price there is. But let's again remind us of that the, what we are competing again is the oil industry, which is extremely heavily subsidized in all aspects. So it's not really about cost that is actually the barrier. It's rather whether there is a political will to actually begin to implement these technologies in order to push forward and actually provide a clean energy uh, uh, to replace, uh, replace oil. So because what we've shown also is that whereas current ethanol production uh, is often claimed not to result in a, in a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emission. This is not the case if we are beginning to produce these longer chain hydrocarbons, and particularly also if we begin to rely on biomass usage. Then we can see uh, from our calculations that we get significant greenhouse gas emission reductions, as well as also we have very good net, net energy balances in these processes here. And so uh, really, uh, the, the, it is a compatible technology that actually can contribute uh, to reaching some of the goals. And on the final note, uh, also biofuels is a clean technology. This was very, very clearly illustrated recently in a study where they uh, were looking into the emission for, from jets uh, that were flying either on regu regular kerosene or on kerosene blended with 50% uh, biofuels. What they were uh, measuring uh, in the emission was the uh, particularly particles, and there was found to be a substantial reduction in particle emission, and this uh, can also have significant uh, impact on, of course, on general pollution, but also on global warming. So again, uh, it is, it is, uh, there is, uh, this added benefit is not only greenhouse gas emission, biofuels also represent a much cleaner form uh, of energy usage uh, for the automotive, as well as for jets, as well as for ships, and so on. And so with that, let me acknowledge uh, the, the, my people, uh, my co-workers that have been involved in this. Uh, their names are listed here. The funders, uh, you offer your attention. And, and again, also uh, very much uh, acknowledgement to the, to the Samson uh, family for instigating this award for this great initiative in Israel. And I'm very happy to be here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Nielsen. Uh, you can, uh, I guess, take a seat there now. And uh, Professor Tarascon now, uh, joint winner, will uh, deliver uh, his lecture uh, entitled Battery Research for Smart Mobility Achievements and New Directions. Professor Tarascon. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And again, let me thank you for this wonderful prize. And let me thank you, the Samsung family, and you all for welcoming so warmly Israel. So today, or the last two days, we enjoy it. We talk about Smart mobility, sorry. Smart mobility and so on. We talked about autonomous cars. We talked about big data, but we never talked about battery, which is at the heart, really, of this chemical device and the electric vehicles. So today, and I'm going to tell you a little more or less what happened in and the field of battery research and showing you how, by doing fundamental science, 
as long as it's still devoted yeah. to specific application, we can have innovations. So I will take two examples to convince you on this. And then, since we have to dream, I will dream with you what could be the future of the battery, like the future of electric vehicle. So first, I should confess that the big revolution in our field didn't come from scientists, but it came from visionary men that is Elon Musk. Indeed, because of this person, two years ago, all the battery business has been shaken. Why? Because in such a case, you can nearly predict that you will have nearly some battery or some energy storage at $100 per kilowatt hour by the year 2020. So this is a revolution in the world of energy management, but also in the world of battery research, and you will see why. So today, what I'm going to try to see more or less is what type of improvement we can do. Here, I put a spider plot where you have here some specific points where we need to increase the specific energy while remaining sustainable and, of course, maintaining low cost. And let me show you, by two examples, how pure fundamental material science can lead to innovation. So I will first start by the classical compound. This is a material that you are all using nowadays, or near closely, and to your laptop and so on. This is this layer compound, lithium cobalt oxide, as you can see in this picture here. Then, through the years, people have played with the chemistry of these materials in which they replace, as you can see here, some of the elements and the metals. And we obtain what we call these NMC materials, where you can see that we have an increase in energy density from 150 to about 180. And nowadays, this is this type of materials that all people have been talking about EV, are using, and lithium ion. But at the research level, we go one step further and try to outpass this limitation of one lithium per metal. And when you do this, you obtain what we call these lithium-rich materials, or lithium-rich and MC phase, where now, for the size story, you have lithium and two these metal layers, and this type of compounds showing you this kind of electrochemical curve, with the good news is now you have capacity of about 270 million per gram. The bad news is that in these materials, we have voltage fade. So if you want to use these materials, you need to go back to the basic principle and fundamental understanding. So in this case, we daily use material chemistry to go back and try to prepare homologues or analog compounds. And we prepare this kind of phase, which is contained written it, and where you have one redox metal. And when we do this, we obtain the same electrochemical performances, as you can see here, but without this voltage fade. So this, we have a kind of model compound in order for, to find out what is really the origin of this new mechanism. And to make the story short, I will, and this slide showing you what we observe. Indeed, when we look at this compound by different techniques, namely XPS, where you are looking, as a matter of fact, of the electron bonding within a compound, we, this, we, in this case, found that we have this kind of peroxo-like species. We were able to confirm this stuff by EPR, where you are looking at different radicals, and then to visualize, we use microscopy, where we were able, in this case, to detect this kind of dimers. This was directly the first evidence of these anionic redox processes into these compounds. So you have a material that we have been using for 25 years, as clearly indicated here. And all the materials that you are using in your lab battery and so on are working under this principle, where when you are going to remove lithium to discharge, as you can see here, you are going to reduce and oxidize the cations that are blinking. So this was the story for the last 25 years. Now, this is no longer true. We just demonstrate that within this compound, you also have another action, which now, not only the cations are playing, but you can see here, bleeping and blue, you have also the anion that does participate in the process. And result is nearly doubling the capacity of your electron materials. So it means more autonomy and so on. And this has opened a totally new area of material research where I am showing you here the pathway to a lot of new compounds that we are presently investigating. So at this point, the question to ask is now electric vehicles that more or less arise for this 
advancements are daily great in terms of sustainability and CO2. And as it was mentioned at this conference, this is only true if the primary electricity is coming from renewable. Now, if you look at the battery by itself, if you do the daily energy life cycle analysis, what you found, as you can see in this slide, that every time that you are producing one kilowatt hour of battery, you are rejecting 110 kilograms of CO2 and about 327 kilowatt hour of energy. So you can see that we have here a problem of sustainability. And when you look more carefully here, you find that this problem of sustainability is becoming for the materials. So this is a red and white. In this case, we now try to develop electrode compounds in a sustainable way which means we try to design electrodes based on abundant chemical elements. We try to prepare these materials by low temperature synthesis process in order to decrease the energy needed for high temperature. We try to look at uh, organic, directly in this case, electrode coming from biomass, and we try to look at new chemistry. And I will just mention briefly the last point that has again led to an innovation. I talk about this new chemistry, and you have a plenty of systems that has been studied nowadays, and all of them, as you can see here, are still not at the maturation stage. Therefore, there is one system that I would like to draw your attention, that is a sodium ion system. The system presents a great interest. As you know, sodium is more abundant than lithium. It's about 5,000 times more abundant. And then we decide really to develop this technology. What you are looking here, now different type of materials. We don't have any longer a layer compounds, but the polyanionic or three-dimensional compounds, and we make this kind of cells. This is more or less the voltage composition cell of a lithium or sodium ion battery, as you can indicate. And when you look at this curve, you can see that we have an irreversibility. And here again, basic material problem. How we can solve this if we want the ability to commercialize this material? So we went back to chemistry, and by very simple tricks of ball milling and so on, we prepared compounds that were containing excess of sodium, as indicated here. And when you use this track, what we are able to obtain, as indicated on this curve, about 10 to 15 percent increase in energy density. So we decide to move one step further and to go from this concept to the development, and we were able, as clearly indicated here, to build the first 80650 prototype of the sodium ion battery. And you can see here the performance where you can get very large long cycle life as well as an amazing power rate, which could be useful since we have heard during this conference about this high charging rate and so on. But a side of bad news was at high temperature this material or this technology was not so performing. And the last six months, this is a recent news, we have designed a new electrolyte that now enables us to obtain good cell discharge performances as well as directly cycling at high temperature. So we have now nearly launched a company that we call Tiamat, who is nearly engaging when rolling in the development of the sodium ion technology. So this is more or less what the two examples. And let me now end up by what will be the business, battery research in the future, and let me make you dream. We have talked a lot about autonomous car. We have talked a lot about reliability. What will be our research tomorrow? Again, our research is all going to be driven by business and by this man. Again, I mentioned he wants to lower the price to $100 per kilowatt hour. How? By doing this simple equation, where you have a parameter that has been talked at this conference, is a battery second life. Which means, battery second life, you want to have your battery, use it for your EVs, and then put in the grids. But if you want to do this, you need to have traceability. You need to know what's going on inside this black box. And this is more or less, you want to know the state of health of the battery, like human body. So, what we want to develop is sensing. Sensing is going to be very important. Like, for instance, we can implant chips and human bodies to treat diabetes. We can use fiber 
to transmit and receive information during surgery, why we could not make the same thing in the battery business? So in 10 to 15 years from now, when you will look at the battery, you will have a positive and negative electrode, but you will have also analytical output. Now, we can dream even further. If we know the state of health of battery, we can develop self healing process, which means that in this case, you look at the battery, as you can see here, the main issue is when running out, you have this formation of this SEI layer who prevents the lithium. This is nothing different that we have again in the medical field when you have cholesterol, where in this case, you have this deposit around the artery that is going to prevent the blood to go through. So here, what we want to do, like in the medical field, we want to do self-healing. Means that we are going to introduce molecules, sensors in our batteries, and then by a stimulus that can be a magnetic field, can be temperature, can be an electrical field, we are going daily to repair the battery. So this is at the beginning of the stage, but we are working on it. How we are going to do it? Again, we need to go back to chemistry. In chemistry, we are going to work at one part of the system that has never been used, that are the separators. And we are going to put function on this separator by either inserting different layers, either doing functionalization, or entering these kind of molecules that will add daily for self-healing. What we are doing presently, you can see already some beginning of this work, where we tried, in this case, to play some chemistry with membrane and so on. And this is an example that we are presently doing, that I found the mechanistic is relatively nice. We take a classical separator in which we are going to put this kind of polyethylene glycol really, pillars, in which we are then going really, to use a cyclodestrin in order to prevent and to trap some of the species being in the redox shuttle going from one electrode to the next. So this is more or less a type of game that we are going to play and we are playing nowadays. So functionalization is going to be essential. So as a way to conclude, what I try to show you here, that definitively we can have innovation at the material levels, and don't forget that EV will only develop if we have the early batteries. And batteries rely on chemistry and interface. But I heard through this conference that also in the case of EV, we are moving from hardware to software plus services. I can assure you that it is the same thing in the battery field. We are going to move from a pure material research to the field of sensing and the field of monitoring. Okay. And they have a denominator common. Also through this conference, I heard that a lot of partnerships and the EV business and so on. I think at the material level, we need to develop partnership. And I think we are working on this stuff to work to develop this kind of partnership with INREP in order really to tackle this very challenging issue of monitoring and sensing. And with this, I would like to conclude. And of course, thanks all my colleagues at the Collège de France. And of course, I want to thank you all for your attention. And once again, thanks for this wonderful prize for Samsung family. Thank you.